Welcome back, church family. I'm Charles Gregory. Today we're going to continue our walk through Genesis together. We're going to cover Genesis chapter 36 today. We see three really important messages in Genesis chapter 36. There are lessons in this lineage. We see that God keeps his promises. We see that God never cared only for Israel. He never cared only for the Jewish people. Rather, the, the Israelites were to be a light to the world around them. And just by the, the inclusion of this, of this lineage, we see that God truly cares for, for, for everyone. And we see that in, in books like Jonah and other passages as well. And, and the third thing we see here is a warning. There, is a, there was a warning for the tribe of Israel in Esau's lineage. And there's a warning that we can get in the church today from this as well. So we'll cover that uh, directly, but, but first, let's open with a prayer. Almighty Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to, to, to be in your word, to share your word. Thank you for this study. It's been enlightening for me, and it's encouraged me, and it's worked on my heart, and it's helped me to, to connect ideas from the Old and the, the, the New Testament. And it's helped me refine my walk. And I, I pray that those that are listening today or, or catch this weeks or even years later on YouTube, that it might do the same for them. Because your word is indeed alive and active and it, it pierces to the heart. May we be pierced to the heart wherever needed so that we might come into compliance with your word and your will so that we might be better instruments for you. Please bring peace to our land. Please bless uh, our governor, Governor Newsom. Please bless our, our, our president, President Trump. And please bless your people that meet at Mariposa Avenue. Thank you for your many great gifts, Father. Please help me to accurately handle your word of truth. It's in Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. Okay, guys. So three things we saw here. As I said, God keeps his promises. God has always desired all men to be saved. That was not new in the New Testament. This is a consistent theme. God is as he was, as he will ever be. And then we see a warning. There, there's a pattern here, uh, that, that one, and an actual warning, that, that we need to watch out for. There was one to the Israelites, and we can certainly learn from it today. So let's, uh, let's go through and, and handle this stuff a little bit at a time. Genesis chapter 36. I'm going to read the first eight verses. Now these are the records of the generations of Esau, that is Edom. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Oholibamah, the daughter of Anna, and the granddaughter of Zibion, the Hivite, also Basemeth and Ishmael's daughter, excuse me, also Basemeth, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth, Ada bore Elipaz to Esau, and Basemeth bore Reuel, and Oholibamah bore Jeush, and Jalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all his household and his livestock and all his cattle and all his goods, which he had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went to another land away from his brother Jacob. For their property had become too great for them to live together. Excuse me. And the land where they sojourned could not sustain them because of their livestock. So Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. So why did Esau leave? We read Genesis chapter 36 verses 1 through 8. Why did Esau leave? Well, it says that the land was not able to, to support both his people Remember, he had prospered while Jacob was away prospering as well. And so the land could not sustain them both. Now, I suspect that perhaps he was already grazing his, his cattle and his livestock uh, in, the, in the hill country. And uh, reading certain scholars, they suspect that, that that was a possibility as well. So maybe it was just natural for him to want to, to move that, that direction. But we're seeing something really neat about... Esau's character. I, I suspect that, that Esau and Jacob had a good relationship. Remember, Esau came 
with a bunch of his trained men to escort Jacob and his, and his, and his crew back, Esau could have at that time done battle with Jacob, and he didn't. And here, again, you know, he, he welcomed Jacob into the land. He didn't do battle with him. He moved. Could it be that, that, that Esau understood the, the will of God? Could it be that Esau, in his humility, was giving, uh, well, was, was conceding to God's will? I think it's very possible. Could God's providence have been involved? And Esau man like, wow, I love this hill country. It's great for grazing. And, and could that have been what he went, you know what, I'll leave this to my brother and I'll go over there. That could be too. We don't know. But, but Esau is recorded as being the one who decided to move to make room for the covenant people. And that says something. It has to say something about the relationship that he and, and Jacob had because we don't, we don't have any record of strife or of warfare at this point. Esau was graceful with his brother. Esau is Edom. That's an important verse. The Esau was the father of the Edomites that happened when he intermarried uh, with the people that were already in this region in Seir. And we'll read about them later. They're, they're, they're okay for now with the Israelites, but as they get farther and farther away from the God that Esau would have learned to worship from his father and from being around Jacob, as they got farther and farther away and they became more like uh, the pagans, they ended up being enemies of the tribe of Israel. And when we go to, uh, I believe it was about 11 BC, we see the Edomites doing fierce battle with, with King Saul. And, and Israel eventually defeats them. Uh, and, and then we don't really hear a whole lot about them from, from, from my reading after that. So Seir is south of the Dead Sea toward the Gulf of Aquaba. Uh, it's between Moab to the north and Midian to the south, to give you an, an idea of where this region is, because this region will become important later when, when reading the, the book of Exodus. The, obviously, Esau did have some impact on, on the culture, or he was taking names that were already in the culture of one. This name, for example, uh, in verse 4, Elipaz, Job's friend in Job 2.11, one of his friends, that was his name. Could it be the same person? I don't know. There's, there's, there's no way of knowing. But either that was a, a name and, and Esau took it to the region or Esau had some sort some impact. And I think Esau did have an impact as we, we'll see when we continue reading on that region. Now, the question is who had more influence on who? And that will become apparent as we continue to read as well. This name Ruel, now these are certainly different people unless he was alive for a really, really long time. Uh, it says Basimeth bore Ruel. Ruel was the name of Moses' father-in-law, who was a priest of, of Midian. Just kind of a, an interesting, interesting connection point. But I think the, big th the biggest thing to take from these first eight verses is that Esau was graceful with his brother. He didn't want to battle with his brother, and when things got too hard to bear between them, he moved. Uh, and then he became Edom. All right, let's read 9 through 14. These men, these then, excuse me, these then are the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Esau's wife, Ada. Ruel, the son of Esau's wife, Basemeth. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, and Gatam, and Kanaz. Timna was a concubine of Esau's son Eliphaz, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Ada. These are the sons of Ruel, Nahath, and Zerah, and Shama, and Mizah. These were the sons of Esau's wife, Basemeth. These were the sons of Esau's wife, Oholibama the daughter of Anna, and the granddaughter of Zibia. She bore to Esau, Jewish, 
and Jalam and Korah. So 9 through 14, we have, we have Esau's sons and grandsons and their lineage uh, laid out for us. We see some interesting names here. We see Amalek. Uh, we see Timon, and, and we'll talk more about them. Amalek I want to mention now because in verse 12, Timna was a concubine. And, and yet they are mentioning the, the children of a concubine here. And I think the reason that's done is probably because... Amalek father the Amalekites, which also would battle Saul several hundred years later. So the so Esau fathered the Edomites and the Amalekites, which would become a thorn in the flesh of Israel until they were dealt with. Let's continue reading in verse 15. To give a a preview here in verses we're gonna read verses 15 through 19 we're gonna see a very different organization start to develop in the way Esau's family or extended family governed itself in the land versus the tribe of Israel a very different organization so Israel was following God's pattern for for organization and leadership at that time. And, and, and it was a, a patriarchal system. Now when we look at, at Esau's lineage, they became like the world around them. And they went to chiefs and princes and kings and started exalting men above their brothers. Very interesting. Okay, so verses 15 through 19. These are the chiefs of the sons of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, are Chief Taman, Chief Omar, Chief Zepho, Chief Kanaz, Chief Korah, Chief Gatam, Gat, Gatam, Chief Amalek. These are the chiefs descended from Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Adah. These are the sons of Ruel, Esau's son, Chief Nahath, Chief Zerah, Chief Shama, Chief Mizah. These are the chiefs descended from Ruel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Basemeth. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Oholibama, Chief Juesh, Chief Jalam, Chief Korah. These are the chiefs descended from Esau's wife, Oholibama, and the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Esau, that is Edom, and these are their chiefs. So the tribe of Timon, I mentioned that, the tribe of Timon became so strong in this area at, at, at one point, and they, they led so strongly that this area in Scripture is sometimes referred to as Timon rather than Edom. And it probably, depending on, on, on the, that kind of probably gives us an idea of what time things were, were written depending on, on, on who was in power. So in Amos 1.12, this area is called Timon. In Obadiah 1.1, it's referred to as Edom, but then in 1.9, it's referred to in Timon. See, we see that in God's word that different people and sometimes places are called by, by different names, as was culturally uh, appropriate at that time. Because different peoples will have different names for the, the same exact plot of land and or even for the same person and that doesn't make it uh, that doesn't make it a uh, contradictory it's just the way we work it's accurate it's honest let's continue reading now in verses 20 through 30 we're going to get a list of pre-edenite people that were in the land that Esau intermarried with. So let's read verses 20 to 30. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land. Now, it's my understanding, I think we see this in Genesis 36 too earlier, that, that Hittites and Horites uh, and, and um, Horian, if I, if I wrote that correctly, Hittites, Hor Horites, Horvites, they, they seem to be interchangeable. They seem to be talking about a, at least a similar group of, of, of people or, or of lineage. 
Anyhow, these are the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land, Lotan and Shobal and Zibion and Anna and Deshaun and Ezer and Dishon. These are the chiefs descended from the Horites, the sons of Seir, and the land of Edom. The sons of Lotan were Horai and Heman, and Lotan's sister was Timnah. These are the sons of Shobal, Alvin and Menahath and Ebel, Shepho uh, and Anam. These are the sons of Zibion. Ahia, I mispronounced that one, Aya and Anna. He is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness when he was pasturing the donkeys of his father, Zibion. I'll come back to that verse in a moment. These are the children of Anna, Deshaun and Oholibama, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Deshaun, Hemden and Eshban and Ithran and Charan. These are the sons of Ezer, Bilhan and Zebon and Akan. These are the sons of Deshaun, Uz and Aran. These are the chiefs descended from the Horites, Chief Lotan, Chief Shobal, Chief Zibian, Chief Anna, Chief Deshaun, Chief Ezer, Chief Deshan. These are the chiefs descended from the Horites according to the various chiefs of the lands of Seir. Ooh, excuse me, there's some mouthfuls there. And I, I try to practice my pronunciation, but I'm, I'm not the best. This passage, this passage, I think that the, the biggest thing we get in chapter 20 through verse 30 as we continue reading and know what happens to these people this is a warning this is a warning for for the the, the tribe of, of for the Israelites and this is a warning for potentially for the church today and I won't reteach that whole lesson but who was affected more who was affected more did did Esau who was Edom did he affect this land more? Or did intermarrying with these folks affect him and affect his, his descendants more? The people in the land that he married with, that, that intermarried with Esau's line, I think they won. Ultimately, I think they affected Esau's lineage and his and their and his children's and his children's children's and their relationship with God more than Esau affected them. What do I mean by that? Well, Esau gained land. Okay, he he won the land battle, but Esau was conquered by the people of the land when it came to the cultural battle. How does that happen? All the Israelites would go in and, 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 and win land and intermarry with those people rather than driving them out. And so then what happened? Well, they would be affected by their foreign spouses and they would become more like the world around them and ultimately they would become distracted from God and perish. And, and that's exactly what happened to Esau. Now that happened to the Israelites. There's so much of the Old Testament devoted to that. The whole judge cycle is about that. And this happened to Esau. They went, he, they went from being friendly with, with Israel to fighting Israel centuries later. And being, ultimately, many of them being destroyed. So Esau gained land, but he was conquered by the people's culture and their false religions. And this is what God saved Israel from in his divine providence at Shechem. Remember when, when uh, the people of Shechem wanted to intermarry because of uh, the, the prince's love for, for Dana, and they got circumcised, and the boys came in and, and killed them all when they were in their pain. God allowed all that to keep Israel from intermarrying with them. He saved them from what happened to, to, to Esau. So this led, you know, this, this intermarriage, it, it, yeah, they gained land, but it led to the ultimate destruction later on by Israel in the time of, of King Saul. So very interesting to see how it all fits together. So there's a warning there. There's a warning there that, that is going to become really, really clear as we continue to read. Let's, and we're going to see this next. Let's read verses 31 through 39. Now there are kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. I'm going to repeat that one. And I'm going to read 39 and we'll come back and touch on this. 
So verses 31 through 39. Now these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinahabab. Then Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah of Bozrah, became king in his place. Then Jobab died, and Husham of the land of the Temanites became king in his place. Then Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Badad, who defeated Midian in the field of Moab, became king in his place. And the name of the city was Avith. Excuse me. Then Hadad died, and Samla of Mezrakah became king in his place. Then Samla died, and Shaul of Rehoboth on the Euphrates River became king in his place. Then Shaul died, and Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, became king in his place. Then Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and Hadar became king in his place. And the name of his city was Pau, and his wife's name was Mehetabal, the daughter of Matred, daughter of Mezahab. Why is all that important? Well, verse 31, a lot of scholars tried to use to prove uh, that Genesis couldn't have been written by Moses. It must have been a much later date. Because after all, how would the author know that there weren't kings in Israel yet, but there would be? Two points. One, context. We've got to look at the context. This is a fulfillment of Genesis chapter 17, verse 6. If you want to flip there with me, Genesis chapter 17, verse 6. Where we see a promise being made to Abraham. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. So this is the fulfillment of Genesis 17, 6. That if Moses had, had written this, like the Bible says he, yeah, he did, he would have known this. And then two, contextually, what did he just say in Genesis chapter 35, verse 11? So this was being written as a fulfillment of Genesis 17.6 with the promise given in Genesis 35.11 in mind. This contextually fits right here. And if you want to look at Genesis 35.11 with me one more time, it is, God also said to him, so this is when, when God is, is reestablishing, not reestablishing, but remembering the covenant with Jacob. Uh, and he's specifically talking to, to Jacob at this point. And in verse 11, he says, God also said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come forth from you. So, now, we know that Moses wrote this, but let's just say, let's just say that if, Oh, if, if, if Jacob himself had been writing this section of Genesis, okay, he could have written it just like that, saying, hey, God kept his word to, to, to my relative Abraham and has some of his descendants already as kings, but the Israelites didn't have kings yet, believing God's promise to him, and it could have been written just like this, just the way Moses wrote it. So taking this one verse out of context and putting a really late date on Genesis doesn't make sense. The second thing is this. Moses was inspired by God. If we believe the Bible's inspired by God, and that's a much larger study, and I certainly believe that. We have to realize people who are biblical, scholar, or are biblical scholars don't necessarily believe that. It's important to note. There are people who are biblical scholars that have forgotten what they are looking at. The Word of God 
And I don't say that blindly. I say that looking at scientific foreknowledge, looking at prophecies that have come true that were written hundreds and thousands of years prior, and looking at archaeological finds that verify these poor people were where they were when they said they were. And that's important. Moses was inspired by God. And look what Moses ends up writing in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17, uh, verses, you know what, I'm going to read 14 through 20. And, and, and the reason I go here is because this, this kind of, this, this proof text and this warning, if you will, that we're seeing developing about kings, and we're going to talk about that a little more, it, it fits in context with, with what the Pentateuch had to say, with what Moses' writings had to say about Israel having kings. So in Deuteronomy chapter 17, I'll pick it up in verse 14. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your countrymen you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. Moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. He shall not multiply wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away. Nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. See, these are things that all the kings were doing. Now it shall come about, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll, in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or the left, so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. So they wanted he knew, God knew, that even though it wasn't what was best for them, they would want an earthly king. They would want to be like the world around them. And guess what, guys? In the church, we have to fight that desire today. We constantly want to be like the world around us. The problem is, when we become more like the world around us, we stop looking like Jesus. And when we stop looking like Jesus, we stop being the light to the Gentiles. And we stop doing what God has commanded us to do. And guess what? When, when these things didn't happen that, that Moses told them to do, when, when, they started, when they started multiplying their horses and their wives and their money, their sons didn't take over. There was problems. When, this, when these things didn't happen, it led to the destruction of that king and to the destruction of Israel at times. Because the people would follow in the king's footsteps, and it was, not, it was not good for them. So what do we see here? What do we see here when, when Edom intermarries into the land and, and they start having kings? Well, we don't see in, 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 Genesis, chapter, in Genesis chapter 36, verses 31 through 39, we don't see fathers being replaced by sons on the throne. Rather, what we see is probably violence. We see people being usurped and, and replaced by, by other groups of people. It's much like what happened in the last several kings uh, in the in, in the northern kingdom of Israel much later. So there are, there are patterns to learn from even these lineages that, that should have been warnings to, to the tribe of Israel and to us today, to be careful, to not be overcome by the world's culture. You know, I wanted to mention one more thing. I, I skipped it, I'll, I'll step back just for a second and then we'll, we'll finish up this chapter and the lesson will be yours. In verse 24, these are the sons of Zibion, 
uh, the one I butchered there. I, Aya and Anna. He is the he is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness when he was pasturing the donkeys of his father Zibion. This is an interesting passage if if you want to study it more. For verse twenty four, hot springs are mentioned in the Masoretic text and and the Vulgate. In the Talmud, and if you're reading the Old King James, I, I believe you'll see this there too. In, in the Talmud, mules are mentioned in the in that verse, which is interesting because this is where they would take they were they were pasturing donkeys basically, and supposedly there were also wild horses in that region. And then, so the story goes that the some of the wild horses bred with the donkeys and created mules. And I was doing some quick research, and we see Homer in Greece mentioning mules being used in Greece around 800 BC. If the Talmud's correct, that means mules were, were around and, and potentially being used by man a, a whole lot earlier than that. So I just kind of... A, an interesting point there from the from this lineage. Okay, so let's pick it up and in, in, back in in verse forty. Back in verse forty, and we'll read forty through forty three. It's at the end of the chapter. Now these are the names of the chiefs descended from Esau, according to their families and their localities. By their names, Chief Timna, Chief Alva, Chief Jehet. Jeteth, Chief Oholibama, Chief Elah, Chief Pinion, Chief Kenaz, Chief Taman, Chief Mizbar, Chief Magdiel, Chief Aram. These are the chiefs of Edom, that is Esau, the father of the Edomites, according to their habitations and their land of their possession. We see from this list, if you dig into the names, that, that some of the chiefs actually took their mother's lineage and, and took their name, uh, or took the name from their mom's family instead of uh, taking the names from their dad's family. Is that another example of the culture winning out over Esau? Potentially could be. Potentially could be. So what did we learn here? What did we learn from this lesson? God keeps his promises. God promised Abraham that he would become the father of, of many nations and that, that, that kings would come from him, and, and we see that happening. God cares for all people. I mentioned that at the beginning. If you want to see a New Testament passage about this, go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. God desires all men or all people to be saved, coming to a knowledge of the truth. You can go... Look at that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. And remember Jonah. If you want to go read about that on your own, Jonah, he wasn't sent to a, a Jewish nation, to, to the tribe of Israel, to tell them to repent. He was sent to a, to a pagan nation. And apparently it wasn't time for them to be utterly destroyed yet because God said, hey, you, you repent or you will be utterly destroyed. So they must have had some knowledge of God. God has always had a plan for the salvation of all of man. Jesus wasn't an afterthought. None of this was an afterthought. And then the third thing we have, like, like I talked about, there's a warning here. We are, we are to work to convert people to God's way and not to be converted by the world's way. Really simple to remember, yet vitally important. We are to convert the world to God's way. We are not to be converted to the world's way. How do we do that? We need to be a people of prayer. We need to be a people who are in God's word every single day, that are meditating on it daily, and, you know, and by the way, on that note, we need to be thankful for this because there were times in history where they didn't have as much access to God's word as we have right now. We ought to be thankful and take advantage of it. So daily prayer, daily study and meditation, and we need to prioritize being 
with the people that belong to the Lord. Jesus said, a new command I give to you, to love one another as I have loved you. And by this love, men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's in John. I'll, I'll put the verse, the exact verse uh, when I go through and edit. Why is that important? Well, if we're not prioritizing the church, if the world is not seeing us prioritize our brothers and sisters in Christ and is not seeing us together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, how are they going to know how much we love each other? How are they going to know, according to Jesus, that, that we are the Christ followers that they need to turn to to get the message of redemption, to hear the gospel that saves? If we are not prioritizing the kingdom, how are they going to know? We have to overcome the world with God's way. We cannot be overcome by the world's way. I hope you've enjoyed this. I certainly did. I'll close with a prayer. Almighty Father in heaven, thank you so much for the folks that, that, that turn in and, and use this opportunity to, to learn a little bit more through Genesis. Thank you so much for everything that I'm learning by, by digging in and, and, and reading a lot more than I, I get to share due to, due to time. I'm enjoying it so much. Please be with the, the Ferris family this week. Please be with my, my buddy Jason as he's patrolling the streets and on his own now as a, as a police officer. There's a lot of craziness out there. Please take care of him. Uh, please be with uh, our congregation at Mariposa Avenue and, 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 and help this Ladies' Day that the ladies are putting together to go well. Please bless our eldership. Please bless our de deacons and, and please bless uh, our minister. And please, please be with the Baker uh, family and be with um, I just totally drew a, a blank there be with the, the, the Baker family and with, with their loss and the Franson family and, and, uh, and their loss thank you so much Almighty Father we love you Lord thank you in Jesus name Amen Whew, guys I'm exhausted very little sleep last night thanks for bearing with me hopefully I didn't get uh, too off the beaten track I appreciate your grace and your, your love. God willing, I'll see you all healthy and well this Sunday. Bye now.